for, for Monica and Pierre, so who would like to start? Yeah, please, I don't know if there's a mic. Yes. <coughs> I wanted to... I wanted to ask whether this is uh, related to the corridor system in, in central bank, you know, targeting an interest rate corridor and exactly where you target, you know, different central banks choose different, you know, interest rate targets relative to the corridor. And if you, you know, some central banks, like for example, Canada, they target the bottom by increasing liquidity a lot. I, I had some impression that that was related, the difference between the, 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 uh, the Fed funds rate, say, and the, and the bottom of the, tor the corridor as a practical matter, might be related to the question of, of, of liquidity that you were discussing. But I wasn't sure on whether that, that was a sufficient statistic or whether there was sort of some additional interest rate in your model aside from the Fed funds rate because of this distinction between inside and outside money. Do you have a few more questions? I'll give you some time. Yes, please, if you have the mic. Um, you, you started off the talk with this interesting picture about uh, the netting down and the role of the asset market. And I just wanted to give you a chance to talk a little bit about how active traders, should we think like trading volume matters for monetary policy, uh, for the mix between reserves and bonds, these types of things? Any others? Yeah, look. Um, yeah, the question I have is uh, how, how we should think of haircuts that central banks would uh, generally also impose on the, on the type of collateral that you have in your economy. So maybe we answer now these questions and then so I'll give the opportunity both to you and, and Pierre. So, uh, so first, thanks a lot, Pierre, for a great discussion. Um, let me start with some of the questions that you raised and then I'll uh, turn to the others. So um, you asked about the, the micro foundation of these leverage costs, uh, and that's a good question. We've uh, assumed this basically exogenous leverage cost function that is smooth and allows us to characterize uh, the entire solution of the model uh, analytically, much to the uh, dislike of, of Pierre, but you can actually do it with pencil and paper. And so that's why we did that. Uh, we are now working on a separate paper that is trying to um, microfound these leverage costs in a model with uh, bankruptcy costs. So banks, uh, in that model, can, there's, uh, there's uncertainty, they can go bankrupt, uh, and in bankruptcy they face costs, uh, fire sale, costs of selling their assets, and that, that is then generating leverage costs that look much like uh, the C function that I was showing you. Um, so this is how I think about the micro foundations. Um, the, uh, the question is, should bank leverage be zero in the model? Um, Introducing production is one way of doing that, uh, but even in this model, bank leverage uh, serves a purpose because uh, households need to pay for consumption with inside money, and so without banks, they can't do, th without the inside money issued by banks, they can't do that, and so already here, bank leverage would not, would not be zero. Um, in terms of thinking about taking this model, so the, the, in this model we're, we're studying steady states, uh, and then we're, we're introducing shocks that temporarily make you uh, deviate from steady state and then you go back uh, in a short amount of time. So this model, because it's so simple, it doesn't have interesting dynamics. Uh, so do you go right back to the new steady state? Well, the advantage is that you can think about uh, the effect of um, various things on inflation, on short-run short inflation, uh, and so that you can analyze things like what happens when asset values collapse, what happens uh, to inflation in the short run, and then you go back to steady state. Uh, we're, we're now uh, incorporating uh, this basically, as I mentioned, we, I view this model as a module that you can attach to other models, so we're working on a new Keynesian version uh, that has a banking sec the banking sector of this model, and in that model, transition dynamics are slower, and so then once you hit asset values, that has an impact on inflation, uh, and then you have the economy transition back more slowly, and so I'm absolutely uh, 
agreeing with Pierre that to think about quantitatively what, what happens in these markets, you have to take into account more, more interesting transitions. So what you're seeing here is basically the simplest uh, model that provides the intuition uh, about how this works with, with these layers. Um, Amy's question about the how does this map to the corridor? Uh, the true answer is, I think I don't know how it exactly, so what, what is true here is that just thinking about the nominal interest rate uh, is not enough. You also have to think about the bank um, balance sheets, how that maps into a corridor system. I will have to think, it's an interesting question I will have to think about. So definitely you're uh, here, monetary policy has to set more than one variable. Um, Arvid asked about trading volume, uh, and that's one of the reasons we built this model is to understand what are periods in which m inside money is sucked out of the uh, goods market and is used for asset trading, does that lower inflation? And so we're now exploring this quantitatively and uh, think that we can clearly see episodes in the data where during episodes of high volume, uh, you have lower inflation, goods, goods there's less inflation in goods prices, uh, but that's all coming up um, in future papers. Uh, the, the question is haircuts that the central bank sets. Here we have this, uh, as Pierre uh, mentioned, well, you can think of this uh, risk weight on risky assets, our row parameter in the, in the paper, as a policy parameter. And uh, to the extent that central banks want to influence haircuts uh, on collateral, that would be the parameter that they would change. So they can uh, set whether um, risky assets are good or bad collateral depending on this, on this row coefficient that they set. Okay, thank you. Pierre, would you like to add something? <laughs> no, I mean, you know, I, I, I think um, I, I, I just ask more questions that I can, that's what I can do. Um, so I understand this justification you give for bank leverage costs, but what about the government oh, level? Oh, yes, What's sorry, the cost yes, of, you know, but the yes, it's, it's uh, bank leverage costs. So the, uh, an implication of a model where uh, the government basically can provide very good collateral uh, in this world. Uh, if, the, if the government provides reserves, banks can hold these reserves and it makes their, it lowers the leverage cost because this is basically perfect, safe collateral. Uh, and so without, if the government doesn't have any leverage costs, um, it should provide plenty of reserves. And so the model says all banks should be, in, should be narrow banks, they should back uh, deposits with reserves uh, that would lower their leverage costs. And in the absence of government leverage costs, that's, that's great. Uh, of course, I, I, I don't think this is reality. Uh, I do think that gov governments in reality do face leverage costs. Uh, and uh, for example, it, it would not be optimal for Greece right now to just flood, to have a flooded system with reserves, unless it's the ECB, you know, countries that have, where uh, governments face, um, where outside investors doubt uh, the, the backing of bonds uh, by governments, uh, that's the type of government that is not going to, or should not uh, issue tons of reserves because that would be additional debt. Uh, and that's not, that's not optimal in, um, and I think that's the, 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 the right way of thinking about it. So how do you think about government uh, leverage costs? Uh, in, in the model, the, the easiest thing which brings uh, the government on the, to the same footing as banks is to have an exogenous leverage cost. Of course, again, you can think of there are uh, models of uh, sovereign default that have uh, bankruptcy costs and a probability that the government may go, go bust. And so that's, that's the type of leverage cost we have in mind. And so the, the, amount, the, the, the amount of commitment uh, that the government can make depends on its tax base, how much uh, things it can tax, it, tax to repay bonds. And, and that's, uh, this is here uh, modeled in reduced form, but a more uh, micro-founded model would have, uh, would have, for example, bankruptcy costs. Jeremy. So, uh, I'm wondering if the cost of, of the, the government having, uh, the central bank basically creating more reserves, you're saying it's a leverage cost. I wonder if it's sort of, if, if you had, I think this relates to a question that, that Pierre asked, which is if you had, um, banks lending, and if there was sort of some real efficiency to their lending, then there's sort of a decentralization question, which is you can imagine a situation where the central bank is very, very big, and it provides a lot of reserves. So a lot of the money is provided by the central bank. But then they're going to have to do a lot of the lending, too. 
you know, you know, if there's a fixed supply of government bonds, eventually if the central bank's balance sheet gets big enough, they're going to have to be doing the lending. So I think that the, the arrangement we have now is the central bank essentially delegates to the banks some of the money creation, therefore allowing them to be the lenders in the economy because we think the private sector makes better lending decisions. So I don't know if what you're calling a, a leverage cost for the government is really sort of a decentralization or a decentralization cost. Right. Is, that, is that an okay I interpretation? I think that's an okay interpretation because the, basically, uh, if you think about how, how, how can you provide a, what, what's the payment system? How can, how can households and asset traders pay for their stuff? And so you need a payment system. And so one, one system would be for, uh, for all of us to have accounts at the central banks uh, and then also get loans from the central bank. That, that would, in that world, the, the central bank would do everything. Uh, or we can have a system where banks do the lending and they create the inside money and the government only provides outside money uh, that we don't use. I, I don't pay you with reserves. And so once we are in that world, I think it, it does make sense to think of both as having leverage costs because if, you, if the government, again, has zero leverage costs, it should be doing everything and it should be issuing tons of reserves. And in a world with lending, it should also uh, do all the, the loans because if, they're, if, if the government is perfect and they have no cost in doing things, they should be doing things. And so this is not the world I think we live in. And so I, I think uh, the world is more like our model where also the government faces some costs and so now you have a trade-off between these costs. In, and you have economies in which the banking system is very efficient and is more efficient than the government and more trustworthy than the government. And you have other countries in which the government is more trustworthy and therefore can issue uh, tons of reserves. Uh, like in the US, I think uh, we, the government certainly faces a lower leverage cost and then has uh, increased reserves dramatically. That would not be possible in other countries. Or, sh or should, or, and would be inefficient from the point of view of our model. Bernard, yes. Final question. Yeah. Sorry. First, I like the paper a lot. I have a question on the title of the paper. You say payments, credit, and asset prices. Why are you so shy at not calling it money, credit, and asset prices? I say that because. If you go back to Irving Fisher, equation of exchange, it's about transactions, and only um, um, Milton Friedman replaced transactions variable with income, with a presumption that money would flow into goods markets and uh, transaction demand for money for goods markets rather than for asset markets. So I would go uh, and introduce alongside the uh, transaction demand for money. Um, Portfolio demand for money in the Tobin in the Tobin type uh, type world, and that would be say the, the natural. I think the natural uh, the natural extension, the natural way to go, uh, to move away from a pure and transactional demand for money um, approach. Uh, just looking at the history of uh, monetary theory, there. Are you are you prepared to go that direction? Uh, it's the next paper, perhaps. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. I'm not going to take a stance right, right now. We're, we're working on, I think, the most important uh, task that we have on our plate is to uh, look at the quantitative implications of, of a version of this model. And so this is in the short run. Uh, I think we're, we're going to um, push the quantitative side, and then we may go back to uh, pushing additional theoretical aspects. Thanks very much. So I think concludes is the first session. I think we are only a few minutes late. Uh, so thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.